giver of life. The Father not only sires children, but he gives life into them. And that's why they call Abraham, Father Abraham, although he was not the bloodline or he was not the sire of them. But they called him Father Abraham because he was the giver of life to the nation of Israel. And when we talk about God, our Father, He is the giver of life to us. That's life in all forms. The spiritual life, the emotional life. And listen to what Paul says here. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray also that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his comparably great power to us who believe. Will you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I pray that you give me eyes to see pray that you give me eyes what you see are doing. What you are doing is to hear what you are saying, what you are saying, and a heart and mind, and a heart that and knows mind. and understands your ways. And know that in the name of your wonderful Son Jesus. In the name of Amen. Your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Thanks, guys. Doing a great job as usual. Yeah. I mean, the musicians love it so much they can't even get off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> You know, a few weeks ago, I kept having this thought that, you know, that I knew was from God. And, uh, and, and what it was, I want you to preach on the two B's. And I'm like, God, what are, you know, te- preach on the two B's, you know. And I kept asking God what these two B's were. Um, Sharon, when I gave her the title of the message, she said it's the two Karens. Of the... I'm not sure about that ask it, because I wasn't, I didn't know what it meant, you know. Um, but I felt God saying that, that most people, including Christians, struggle with these two Bs. And, and the Bs that I'm talking about is belief and behaviour. And we live with belief and we live with behaviour. And sometimes we struggle, which one do we live with? Which one do we concentrate on? Which one do we put effort into? And, and if we don't understand how to live with these two Bs in our life, we can often find ourselves going in the wrong direction. And as, you know, it, it can take us where we really don't want to go at times. And because belief and behaviour determine how we live our lives. And, and you can tell that by most people. You see the way that they live their lives and you will watch their beliefs and you will watch their behaviours. And, uh, and we don't live contrary to our beliefs and behaviours. At times we might, I'm not saying that you know, we won't at times do that, but usually we live according to our beliefs and our behaviours. They determine the path that we have in life. And so I'm trying to understand in my life, what am I trying to strengthen the most? Am I trying to strengthen my belief system or am I trying to strengthen my behaviour? Um, and... So then it took me down the path, well, what does the Bible say about our beliefs and our behaviour? And so when I think of it, I've got to think, okay, what what does it look like living with behaviour in my life as the main focus in my life? And so if we have a look at 1 Peter 2, verse 11 to 12, it says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and as strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Listen to this. Keep your behaviour excellent amongst the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, the Bible's filled with scriptures about our behaviour. Good behaviour, bad behaviour. And, and, and... It shows that it makes life better or worse for us. Yeah. You ever seen someone with really bad behaviour and, and their life, you know, uh, sometimes see people 
who claim to be victims, but it's not that they're a victim, it's their ba bad behaviour that causes so much problems. Mm. You know, I used to know a guy who, you know, used to hate the police because the police were always on his case. Well, he's always doing stuff wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't the police, it was behaviour, his behaviour, that was creating the problems in his yeah. life. And then I see other people that, that look at someone and they go, oh, look at them, yeah, so they've got so much money, they've got so much, they've got... And their behaviour is because they've been focused on doing what is right in their life. And so we've got to understand that the Bible is not against behaviour. You know, sometimes we, we think, well, you know, like, we don't want to go on this behaviour trip because uh, God isn't interested in our behaviour. God is interested in our behaviour, but it, our behaviour does not determine our relationship with God in the fact that he loves us regardless of our behaviour. Now, those of you that know kids understand that. You love them regardless of their behaviour. Their behaviour does not determine whether you will draw them near into that love circle or not, you will still draw them near, but you just don't like the behavior that they have. So I want to just get that clear because some people think that they can win God's favor and win God's approval by their behavior. You cannot win God's approval or his love by your behavior. I might have just harped on that a little bit, but some people still, because I watch people, you know, sort of trying to do the right thing all the time to please God. God is pleased by faith, not by That's your right. behaviour. Mm. Okay. okay, so um, one problem that we can have of working when working on your behaviour is that it can become so conformed and so forced that it constricts the absolute freedom that God gives you. Mm. We can make behaviour our law. And so it's like, well, we can't do this, can't do that, yeah. And, and I think I've said this before, that when I became a Christian, I was still smoking cigarettes. Oh, you say, oh my God, a cigarette smoker. No. As a Christian. No. Some of you are going, go for it, son. Yeah. <laughs> but I was smoking cigarettes, but you know, a lot of people said to me, oh, you know, like, you're not a good Christian if you smoke cigarettes. God can't bless that. Well... You know, the thing is that God gave me a brain to look at a packet of cigarettes and see tongues hanging out and <laughs> holes in heads and things like that, you know, and go, listen, I don't want you doing that. But it wasn't anything about, you know, sort of holiness. Holiness is not determined by whether you smoke cigarettes or not. Yeah. But God was saying, listen, if you want to make sure that you keep your tongue in your head and the doctors don't take it with them, that's a good idea to stop smoking cigarettes. Now... But a lot of people were saying, you know, oh, you need to conform to this because we conform to this. And the thing is that when you are like that, it inhibits the freedom that God gave you because it's trying to live a certain way because others expect it. Mm. Have you ever tried doing that? I have, and it's so hard to live the way others expect me to live. You know, when in the early days of this church, uh, I had a, a woman who worked in the church come to me one time and she said, you're making it really hard for my family. I went, what? She says, because I've been told that you watch M-rated movies. <laughs> I know, you absolutely <laughs> disgusted with me. <laughs> because you all watch M-rated movies yourself. <laughs> It's just mature. Mature. We're not talking about X-rated movies. We're just talking about M-rated movies. But this one wanted me to conform to her standards. Now, if I did that, it would be so constricting upon me. When I got saved, people told me that I had to throw... I had a record shop, okay? Oh, no. When I was younger, I had a record shop. And, and anyhow, a guy ripped us off. And so we ended up with stock. And I had... I had some beautiful records, you know, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, and you know, Deep Purple, and all of those records, and I love them. But when I became a Christian, there are the devil. You know, you can't listen to those. Well, what do you do with them? I thought, oh, sell them. You want money for them. Well, you can't push that onto someone else. That's giving your sin to someone else. What do I do with them? You need to throw them in the tip. 
So I went up to the tip oh. and used them all as frisbees. Oh. <laughs> and then when I finally found out that Christ gives us freedom, I was like, oh, no, I could have had those. I still like listening to some of those on Spotify. Yeah. Because, you know, there, are, there is some ungodly music. But do you know the thing is that the only thing... No, I'll refrain again from that. What that statement. There is no ungodly music. Okay? There is only ungodly lyrics. Yeah. How yeah. can music yeah. be ungodly? Yeah, yeah when, I, when I got saved, these were of the devil. Yeah. You couldn't have drums in church. Yeah. Why? Because they came from Africa. <laughs> That's where all the demon worshippers were. No were beating drums. And it was like, come on. Yeah, you know, like that's that's stupid. It, it is that music is what God intended it to be, delightful to the soul. Yeah. It's the oh, lyrics yeah, that we have to be careful of. Mm. I've gone off track, but it was a little yeah, heavy horse then, anyway. Yeah. But but see, that type of behaviour can conform to the law, not the freedom that Christ gives us. Yeah. Mm. See, we can learn to control behaviour on the outside. But have you ever heard the statement where, where we used to talk about kids like this? You're standing up on the, I mean, you're sitting down on the outside, but you're standing up on yeah, the inside. Yeah. Have you ever had that? You know, you can conform your behaviour, but be fuming on the inside. Mm. And so, where's the freedom and liberty in that? That controlled behaviour can often cause tension. Now, I'm going to explain all this as we go down because a lot of you are going, well, hang on, how, what, how do you handle behaviour then? Well, we'll talk about that later. But just understanding, if we allow the law to determine our behaviour, then we will have tension on the inside of us. Yep. And we'll, you know, tension you know, explodes at some stage. And you can find a person, oh, isn't that person sweet? Butter wouldn't melt in their mouth. And then one day, bang, they're just off and running. You know? And you think, what was that? That was a major explosion that happened in their life. Well, they were just behaving according to what everyone else wanted them to behave. They were holding it all in, and then they could no longer do it. And, uh, and, and I'll give you an example. How many of you sin? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people have put yeah, their hand yeah, up, the rest of the time. I ain't going yeah, yeah. anywhere because where's it going with this? <laughs> well, okay, let's say we all sin. How many of you want to sin? Mm. How many of you want to No, how many, uh, as a Christian, you don't want to sin. As a non Christian, you're loving it. As a Christian, you don't want to sin. Mm. Yeah, you go, God, I don't want to do that. Mm. Now, what stops you? Is it that you're controlling that behaviour? And then at some stage, you can no longer control it and you do what you don't want to do. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. So controlled behaviour is something that we have to understand, to be careful about. And as I said, we'll get to this later on. But listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 to 7. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognise this about yourselves, that, Je that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. But I expect that you will realise that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do nothing wrong. Not so that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, that we may appear unapproved. Now, this passage of Scripture means that I need to still understand my behaviour and know if it's what God desires. Okay, so remember I'm talking about not control behaviour. I need to understand what is my behaviour on a daily basis and is my behaviour what God desires? So when I'm talking to my wife, treating my wife, or when I'm treating other people, what's my behaviour in those? Now, how many of you have had that, that revelation at some stage in your life that you self said it? None of you, of course. <laughs> and if you haven't, then you need to pray. And as Don said last night, God search me. But yeah, like many of us will have our self-centered times. And so Paul here is saying, test those things, test where you're at, 
Test where you're at in your relationship with God. Yeah. Test where you're at in your behavior with other people and determine, is this what God has for your life? So that's why I'm giving you, I don't have a problem with behavior. I have a problem trying to understand that behavior is a relationship to God. And so I, one of the ways that is great to check your behavior is uh, in the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs can tell you a lot about behavior. And so if we go to those books and have a look, then I can test myself through scripture. Where am I at in this relationship? Now, what I want to talk to you, we move off behavior and go and have a look at belief. The book of Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man believes in his heart, a man or woman, so they are, which, Literally translated, whatever you believe in your life is how you live your life. It flows out of you. That's why the important thing where uh, the book of Proverbs also says, uh, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of your life. Guard your heart, because out of your heart will flow your belief system, will come from your heart. And so behavior nearly always follows belief. At some place, so, so if you've got a belief system running here and your behavior is counterintuitive towards that behavior, cutting across, intersecting it, as a Christian, you know, like when we get saved, our belief system comes here and our behavior is like this. It's totally at odds with that belief system. You ever notice that? Mm. That when you got saved, you still had a lot of worldly stuff going on in your life that mm. you maybe thought was right or you were doing and so what happens is we have a belief system here as a christian what happens is as it comes closer it curves up and our behavior and our belief system start to align they run parallel it might shoot off at different times but it will come back in if that is the true belief that we have we will always adjust our behavior especially as Christians, mm. to what we believe, yeah. Yeah. if we truly believe in it. Now, listen to what it says um, in Romans 10. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we preach. That if you confess with your mouth, now this is coming out of the mind. What comes out of your mouth usually comes out of your mind. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart mm -hmm. that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the belief is situated not in the mind. The belief is always situated in the heart. If you try to believe with your mind, then that will... How many people know that their minds change? You go to the... Some of you did this this morning. You went to your wardrobe and went, I'm going to wear this to church. And then you went, no, I don't think I'll wear it. I think I'll wear this. I'll wear these shoes. No, I don't think I'll wear those shoes. I'll wear these shoes. Why? Because you changed your mind. But if, if, if God said, if you wear the blue shirt today, you will be truly blessed. I yeah. believe God, so I'm wearing the blue shirt. And then you look at the, the, the green shirt, and it's like, I'm wearing the green shirt because I know God said the blue shirt's a blessed day today. That's what you'll do. And, and so, <laughs> so, so look at this. I wasn't even looking at them when I said that. Don's got the blue shirt on, Josie's got the green shirt on. Don's saying, I'm blessed. <laughs> <laughs> so the issue is always with the head and the heart yep. the head and the heart that's where we struggle with in our behaviors and Jesus comes to a demon possessed boy and the father comes to him and says listen my son's demon possessed if you can help us and Jesus says Listen, if you can, just believe. What a simple statement, just believe. Now, I'm going to be speaking at the end of this, because how do we just believe? But he says, just believe. And, and the Father says, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Where do you think he was believing? I already told you. 
in the heart. Where do you think his unbelief was going on? In the head. See, he was looking at his son, and in the heart, he knew this Jesus was the son of God. He knew that he was a miracle worker, and he's looking at his son. He says, in here, I can believe, but here, man, I'm having trouble here. And that's what we need to understand, that we truly have to get our belief system determined in our heart, regardless of what our head says to us at times. You know, I see so many people struggling in the, in the place of healing where it's like, you know, I, I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he can do anything, that nothing is impossible with him. And then their head just rails against that. And so they find it hard to stick to it. And people waver if they allow the head belief to take over from the heart belief. That's why it says God loves faith. Faith is not accumulated in your head it's in your heart faith is surrounded in your belief system and your belief system as i said will always be in your heart and and when we confuse these two then that's when all of a sudden our behavior takes off in a different direction how many people believe that church life is so important Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what we need yeah. But do you know there's, not, there's a lot of people that aren't here? That could be that all of a sudden they had have a belief system, but their head has taken another turn. Yeah. And they've <coughs> headed off on a tangent somewhere. Mm. Because you will follow what you truly believe in your heart. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, If a person lives according to the Spirit, because Paul again says, and understand this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does that sound like behavior to you? It does to me. But whereas the lust of the flesh sounded like bad behavior, this one sounds like good behavior. This sounds like the behavior that God would want for my life, now, how do I get that behavior into my life? It says, walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, I have to have a relationship with the Spirit to know what the belief system really is. If I believe that the Holy Spirit can determine my behavior by living through me and by me being obedient to Him, then my behavior will be consistent with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If I do not believe that, if I see it as a scripture, and I think that's a nice scripture, but I never truly believe that, then my behavior will take a different turn. Mm. So that's why, if I have that belief system in my heart, guard your heart above all else, for out of it flow the behaviors of your life. It says the issues of your life, but behavior out of your heart flow the behaviors of your life. Do you know, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit the access to our heart and the fruit of the Spirit to be our behavior, then we will look to control behavior. And people that don't have the Holy Spirit controlling their behavior, many are in jail because that's the way to control behavior. If the behavior is out of line and we can't get people to accept the Holy Spirit in their life, then what do we do? We put them in jails. That's why there's more non-believers in jail than there are believers. Because believers go... Holy Spirit can control my life. And so there's not the propensity then to end up in those places. You know, when we, when we train our children, train up a child in the way that he should go, do you know the problem that most of us as Christians have is we train our children in godly behaviour. You think, well, what's wrong with that? 
I believe that we should train our children to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Mm. Because if our children are trained in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will live through them and the Holy Spirit will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. The Holy Spirit will bring the behaviour out in their lives. So if we look at belief and behaviour, how do we live with both of them? Because there's a little bit of a tension between those things. And the question that I have is, how do I learn to believe and how do I help others to learn to believe? Because if the key thing here is the belief first, belief and behaviour follows. Belief first, behaviour follows. Behaviour never goes first and then behaviour brings belief in. Because I know lots of people that are great behaviourally, but they don't have a belief in the things of God. Mm. They are really nice people, mm. but they don't know Jesus. Mm. And so you, it's important for us to understand that the belief, how do I believe, and how do I get others to believe? Now listen to this in Romans 10, verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How do you get people to believe? They have to be told. We want to see the world saved? Well, mm. prayer helps. Yeah. But unless they're told, yeah, Paul said, right. it won't happen. Amen. People can't believe something they don't know. Yeah. Mm. People can't believe something they haven't heard about. Yeah. They have to hear the truth before they can believe. Mm. So that's why you and I really need to have our belief system established. Mm. Because otherwise, how can we tell someone that we're something that we don't know, mm. something that we're unsure of? Mm. So our belief system has to be rock solid. What are we standing on? We're standing on that firm, firm foundation. Our foundation in Christ has to be unshakable, that we believe these things, that we truly believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sins Amen. and he rose from the dead for our life. That we have to believe that he can live in us and through us, that he can speak to us, that he can guide us, that he can direct us. We have to believe those things because if we don't believe those things we will be on shaky ground and we can never impart shaky ground into another person's life. We've got to give them something rock solid. Now listen to this. Proverbs Three, chapter 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Belief comes by accepting what you have heard as truth. I'll say that again. Belief comes by accepting what you have heard is truth. Now, if you do not trust the source of that information, are you going to accept it as truth? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So we really have to trust the source of where this information of truth has come from. So we have to trust God has said what he has said, and it is true. Mm. You know, there's so many people trying to find loopholes in the Bible. And why do you want to find a loophole in the Bible? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> is it to justify what we do wrong? Mm. I think so. We don't need loopholes in the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and so, <coughs> the biblical word for trust is to be confident, be secure and to feel safe. 
Now, I have to be confident, feel secure, and feel safe in the fact of what God has written in here mm -hmm. that it's true. You say, what about this? What about that? There's some things that I haven't got the answers for. Some things I won't know about. But the basic tenets of the gospel have to be that I believe are true. That I can't be shaken from those things. Mm. Now, once that is there, see, we talk about evangelism. And evangelism is going to a lot, uh, lots of people that don't know you. And, and that's true. But you know what? Lots of Christians came to me that I didn't know and they preached the gospel and I didn't believe them because I didn't know them. And I was an untrusting person. So why should I trust what they were telling me? It was only when the people that I really knew from my childhood came to me and started to tell me about the truth of the gospel that I said, I can believe you because I know you. I trust you. And if we are going to get to people's lives with the gospel... We need to be looking for the people that we know, yeah. the people that trust us, the people that have seen our life, the people that have seen us established over the years as Christians that are holding on to the things of God and not being shaken. And if we can understand that, then people can look at us and go, I feel safe, I feel secure, I feel confident in what you are saying to me. And then we just present them the truth, not our truth. Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't have a my truth. Yeah. Mm. I have a the truth. Yeah, true. Yeah. Mm. My truth might depend upon how I feel on the day. Mm. <laughs> my truth might depend upon my perception of what Scripture's saying. I go, you know, I, <clears throat> I struggled with the six-day creation mm. as a young Christian. And I argued it with a guy that lived, be he lived behind us and, and so he was like a bit of a mentor to us. He'd been saved most of his life, you know. And he would go, you just got to believe. And I'd go, no, no, you know, but this and this and this and this. And, and finally, it got to the stage where I thought, well, if I try to struggle against this six-day creation, I've got a lot of rabbit holes to go down. <laughs> I've got a lot of twists and turns that I'm going to have to take. Would I just prefer to say, God, I don't know. But if you said it, yeah, I'm just going to hold to that yeah. until yeah. there's something different. Yeah. Yeah. And so I believe in a six-day creation. Why? Well, because it's in here. I just believe it. Nothing is impossible with God. But what about all the fossils I found? I don't know. I don't understand. But if God created it, well, he just made it uh, aged really quick. <laughs> See, our behaviour is important to our own spiritual health. And it is important to those that we witness to. Yeah. That's what Paul was saying in that earlier scripture. If we're going to try to witness to people, he said, let them see this godly behaviour in your life that they might approve of you. Don't let them see you know, stuff in your life that would be ungodly. Allow the Holy Spirit to do that. But unless we believe all that God has said to us, we will struggle through our Christian life. And, and you might think struggle is part and parcel of your Christian life. We will to struggle. <coughs> our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. Rulers of this dark age. God never intended for me to struggle in my life with Him. He meant life to be abundant for me, enjoyable for me, and to recognize that the enemy would come against me and he would try to throw darts and everything else at me, but it would only be a struggle. It wouldn't be a defeat. Only a struggle. I'll say that again because someone needs to hear that. It's not a defeat. It's just a struggle that you're going through. Mm. So, if I understand all these things, my desire <clears throat> is, firstly, that I would believe that Christ has given me everything that I need to live this life. Mm. There's nothing 
that we are lacking to live the way that Christ intended us to live. You might go, well, there are certain things that I'm lacking. I'm lacking confidence. I'm lacking you know, courage. I'm lacking finances. Well, that's not God's desire. So God can open your heart to bring the confidence into you. You've just got to believe. God can open someone's wallet to help you through any financial situation. You've just got to believe. Now, we've got to be wise in all of that too. Because God doesn't expect someone to pay for things that I'll blow on things that shouldn't be in my life. Mm. I've got no money. We'll stop playing the papers. Well, what if God gave me some money, that would help me. Yeah, you probably put that through the papers. So, do you understand that? If I believe that Jesus has given me everything that I need for this life, then if my behaviour is not matching what I believe, then I need to go back and I need to look at that. Paul said this statement. He said, learn to live in the Spirit and you will not fulfil the lust of the flesh. That's the behaviour that I don't want, the lust of the flesh. Learn to live in the Spirit and you won't have this in your life. Learn to live in the Spirit and you will have this. Love, joy, peace, patience, grounds, goodness, faithfulness, generous, self-control. Learn to live in the Spirit and you will have this in your life. My encouragement to you today is do a check first. What's my belief system look like? Is my belief system, do I say that I believe something and consciously live another way? And if that's true, then God, I just need you to help me to cement this belief system in my heart so that it's unshakable, so that it can't be moved, so that I am so strong, we might call it fundamental Christianity, so I am so strong in my belief system that I will not go down those other places. Now, if you're here this morning or you're watching online, you might go, uh, I've never understood how to get this belief system activated, operating in my life. Well, the first thing is that you have to ask Christ into your life. Many people ask Jesus to forgive them for their sins. And that is great. That's your ticket to heaven. If you go, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and I want you to come and be my saviour, man, you have that ticket for heaven. But that then doesn't determine how life will turn out for you because we have to go past that and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be the one that leads me, guides me, directs me, corrects me. That's what I want you to be in my life. Many people make the the mistake of Jesus as Saviour, but they never have Jesus as Lord. If Jesus is Lord of your life, then the Holy Spirit has free access to come and do what he needs to do in your life. But if Jesus is not Lord, then when the Holy Spirit comes and wants to direct or correct or adjust, I'll be like, no, back off. So... I just want to encourage you today that in a moment we just take time just to bow our heads and talk to God. If you have made Jesus Lord but you've never made him, I mean if you've made Jesus Saviour but you've never made him Lord, today is a good opportunity to do that. Some people are frightened about Jesus being Lord. What if I give him full control? What will it be like? Great. (laughs) He's the best Lord you can ever have. Absolutely. And if you've never, ever asked Jesus into your life, then today is a great opportunity to ask him, firstly, to forgive you for your sins, to become the saviour of your life, and then the Lord. So let's just close our eyes for one moment. If that's you, if God's speaking to your heart, if God's encouraging you to make those choices and decisions, I just want you to follow your heart at the moment. 
follow what God's doing there at this particular time. And just let him have his way. Father, giver of life. Father, you've given life to us through your son Jesus. And today, we just make that decision that we want Jesus to be Lord. We want the Holy Spirit to guide and direct, to strengthen and encourage, to correct, to adjust, whatever is needed in our life, so that we might have the opportunity to reach our world for Jesus. That people might see in us something different to what the world is offering them. That they would see the beautiful nature of the Holy Spirit shining through our lives on a continual basis. They wouldn't see the nature of us, they'd see the nature of Him. And because of His incredible love, because of His incredible tenderness, that their lives, each and every person here, their lives would be turned around. That we would see those lives prospering. We would see those lives flourishing. We would see people stepping into something new that they've never stepped into before. An incredible intimacy with you, Father, that has not taken place. And so we ask you this morning that we know that only you can do that as long as we surrender. And so this morning, we just surrender to you. Have your will and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Let's stand, church. Wonderful. Awesome. 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 Awesome.